right, folks. Let's get started. I don't know if there's going to be a ton of noise in All right, so somebody, whoa, sorry, uh, there we go. Okay, so somebody catch us up, remind us what are the principles of security? Yes, or the one, give me one. Confidentiality, okay, what does confidentiality mean? There you go, yes. So I, I like to think, when you think about these components, you want to think about them more at a high level, right? Of, rather than the mechanisms of how you enforce confidentiality, um, exactly the way to think about it is only people who are authorized to get access to data get access to that data. Yes? Um, integrity. Integrity. So what's integrity? Somebody else. Yeah? Good. So trustworthiness, origin of data, so trying to think through and understand, is this data what it's <coughs> supposed to be? Did anybody modify this data? Did anybody change this data? Is, let's say, the person who's creating this data and communicating it to me, did anybody else modify it along the way? Awesome. And what's the third part that we talked about? Availability. Availability. So what's that? Yeah, on the spot. How accessible the information is at any time, is it can multiple people access it, or is it Right, so thinking about how we access information, and not just information, but systems as well, right? So a system, if it's insanely secure but nobody can use it, then it's basically useless, right? And it doesn't accomplish the organization's needs. Cool. Any other comments on, oh, now I see the access control and encryption part here, yes. So these are uh, concepts that we're going to talk about later that fit into confidentiality and are how we can enforce confidentiality. But uh, them by themselves, you, if you mess up your access control policy and say that everyone can access anything, then you're still probably violating confidentiality. Any other comments on this? Thoughts? Cool. OK, so we ended, what was that, Thursday? It seems like a long time ago. Um, so we, talked, uh, we started talking about threats. So what do we mean, like, what, what is a threat <coughs> in this context? Yeah. Like, perhaps like a virus? Or Why is a virus a threat? Can you define a virus? What's a virus? Um, something that probably, like, attacks your system in a way that you don't want to. Okay. So then why is a virus a threat? It violates one of the three components of security. Ooh, good. Good answer. <laughs> Very broad in a good way. Um, <laughs> So, okay, so a virus, uh, has anyone ever had a virus on their computer before that they know of? Yeah, I'll include myself in that. Um, so a virus you can think of as essentially an unwanted piece of code that is running on your computer. So it's something, usually its intent is malicious. The intent could be to either, let's say, send out spam emails from your machine. It could be to try to launch a denial of service attack against a website. Um, it could be sitting there on your computer, watching everything you're logging into and stealing your username and passwords to all the websites that you use and then sending that to the attacker. Uh, it can be a number of different things. And so usually, uh, they, there's a number of ways they get on your computer. It can be as easy as you download an EXE because you think you're at some shady website and you have a crack for a um, game and then you run that executable, and it maybe uncracks the game, but also, unbeknownst to you, installs and leaves this virus that's running there. Uh, or it could be, uh, I guess mean, the most complicated example is you're running an outdated web browser, you visit a web page, the JavaScript code on that web browser, on that web page exploits a known vulnerability in your web browser or in your Flash plugin which then allows it to escape the JavaScript sandbox and allows it to drop a file on your computer, execute it, and start running as you. Um, so all the different kind of ways. And so the threat, so then kind of, so then the threat there is there's some, you can think of this like code with malicious intent in some way of thinking about it. Uh, there's this code that has malicious intent that's on your system that is doing something that a bad person wants it to do, which you probably do not, which could violate your confidentiality. It could, so did we talk about ransomware? Yes. 
Kind of. Kind of. I think we touched on it a little bit. So let's rank somewhere. Yeah, in the back. Yeah, so typically what, what the whole underground economy, what it used to be is these terms of kind of viruses. So what, what would happen is um, they actually started to specialize into separate subgroups. So you had people who were really good at getting executable code on your machine and running as you. But they were like, hey, we don't want to figure out what to do with this machine. So we'll sell this as a service. We'll create a website where people can go pay us money uh, to upload their malware and we'll run it on the thousands of machines or hundreds of thousands of machines that we have and charge that person money. So those people are the ones who send out spam and do all those kind of things. Um, eventually, somebody I guess realized, uh, I guess you could kind of time it with the rise of kind of cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, of uh, having a pseudo anonymous way of paying and transferring money that's uh, not refundable. So the idea was, well, now let's just attack the user directly. Because as we know, they probably have sensitive information on their computers. Would you all agree with that? Yeah. We talked about some kinds of things, pictures, documents. Think about your homework assignment that you're working on, let's say, a week before the deadline. Um, I know we thought that was funny. You all started super early on all of your assignments. Yeah, I've, I've seen it. Um, I did it too. I'm not judging. Just the reality. Um, think about a business. Do you think organizations on their desktop machines have important files on their systems? So I think we so do we did I ask how many people worked at a company? I don't think I did. Sorry. I thought I'm different. I covered a class for another professor yesterday, and so my mind is all jumbled. Um, so people who've worked at a company, what kind of important files are on people's computers? Yeah? Um, internal software. Internal software, so kind of like a, a custom software that's only for that company that they use to run their business, yeah. Classified information. Classified information, if it's a military organization, yeah. Customer information. Customer information, so information about your customers, what else? Source code. Source code, the source code, yeah. Vulnerabilities on their servers. Ooh, vulnerabilities on their servers, that would be a very uh, organized organization if they actually have that information. Um, but that's a good step, yeah. AWS credentials. So yeah, think about all that data, and you think about um, I mean, you think about the department here at ASU, right? We have there's files of all of you guys, all of your grades, who you all are, all this kind of stuff. So what essentially what the ransomware authors realized is rather than do this kind of indirect monetization where somebody else pays you to execute some malware on somebody's machine, which maybe sends out spam, which is how they get paid. Uh, why not just basically say, I have execution on your machine, give me money, and basically hold people hostage. So that's where the ransom part of ransomware comes in. Um, and so what they started doing is they started encrypting all of the, let's say, important files on your hard drive. So they'll encrypt images, documents, everything, with a key that only a remote server knows. So as soon as it's done doing this, it pops up a message that says, hey, um, today's your lucky day. You owe us however many Bitcoin, three Bitcoin. We've encrypted, we're basically holding ransom all of your files. If you want access to them, you need to pay the ransom. Um, otherwise, all your data is going to be lost. So how many of these people do you think have backups of their data? How many of you have backups of your data? Good. With what? The Dropbox? Google Drive? Thumb Drive? Good. You should go home and do that if you don't have it already. Because yeah, this could—I mean, this could happen kind of despite your security hygiene. Um, and so, actually, so the, there's a couple funny things here. A, the documentation that these people have to write, the ransomware authors of how to go buy Bitcoin and send it to somebody, is some of the best documentation on how to actually <laughs> acquire Bitcoin, um, which is really funny. But when you think about it, that's what the criminals—the criminals aren't going to get paid if people don't know how to pay them, right? So really good tutorials on how to do this. Um, other funny things are people, I mean, uh, so there's a couple funny things where people have found that sometimes the encryption is really bad, and so they're able to make tools that can undo it. But fundamentally, once something's executing on your computer with your permissions, right, it can do anything to the computer that you can do, including deleting files. And if the cryptography is done correctly, then there's really nothing you can do to recover it except for get a back user backup or pay the money. 
Um, so this has actually hit a number of real world companies, I think. I, I know police departments have been hit. I believe there was a hospital that was hit at some point. And eventually they usually pay the ransom because to the company it's like, I don't know, a couple thousand dollars to get their files back is worth it in that instance because otherwise they can't do anything. Yes? Um, so like a general question. So like, <coughs> like um, outside of uh, ransomware, mm -hmm. like what is a, the uh, objective for people to create like viruses? Hmm. So usually it's control of your machine. So in general, they want, so if I'm gonna take down, let's say, I don't know, I, I wouldn't target Amazon, but let's say a mid-tier, I don't know, a local website or a local company that's making money that relies on their website. Um, if I wanted to extort them for money and say, hey, give me $1,000 or else your site goes down. If I just have my machine, I can't generate enough traffic to take them down. What I need to do is use at least a thousand machines if not more have them all like create essentially what's called a botnet i control all these machines i say okay take down that that system send a bunch of data to it and then i send them an email saying hey it looks like your site's down that's terrible i run an anti ddos thing uh, if you pay me a couple thousand dollars i'll make sure this goes away um, and so that's one way they gain money the other main way is through credentials and credit cards so by stealing Username, passwords, credit cards, social security numbers, date of birth, address. This can all be sold on the underground economy where people will then go and make fake or make real looking credit cards with your credit card number on it with somebody else's name so they can actually go use it to buy things. Uh, it's all kinds of crazy stuff. So, but this, so this is, and that's a good question. So how does that relate to threats? So that's, it's, uh, yeah, compromising the three aspects that we just talked about. And when you're thinking about threats, and you're thinking about threats to a specific system, you can create more realistic threats if you understand what the, essentially, the attacker's mindset is, right? About what is their goal? Are they trying to make money? Are they politically motivated and trying to break into you? Are they trying to steal state, state secrets? Like, what are they actually trying to do at the end of the day? And so that can help you think of threats. So what are some of other threats that we should be considering or thinking about in general? Insider. Insider threats. What's an insider threat? You don't trust people on the inside? No. No? Why not? Because <coughs> uh, people can, it, it, it varies from person to person, but someone can be an idiot or someone could go, get into an organization and not like what they see in that and try and release them. Yeah, so an insider threat is basically you can think of as any threat that can occur based on somebody who's inside the company, inside the organization. It's not something that you would normally typically think about because we're mainly focused, I mean, when we think about threats, we think about external threats, right? Like who's gonna come attack us? But insiders can do just as much, if not more damage. So there was a story, I think it was in the early mid 2000s in Australia where there was a sysadmin who was working at a sewage processing plant and this person was fired, which is what happens, right? And then this person was upset that they were fired, which also happens, uh, but this, they decided to get revenge on the company. They realized all their credentials still worked to access all the systems. So they logged in and caused, uh, I believe, sent some commands to release the sewage gates or something so that a bunch of sewage flew, uh, flowed into the ocean and caused like, actually it's like a huge ecological problem. There was like sewage all over the beaches um, where like nice hotels and tourists were. It actually caused a lot of damage. So uh, I believe that person was found and prosecuted and spent some time in jail for doing that. So that's a really good example of a case where you need to think about like, okay, you fire somebody. Well, how long do they have access to those systems for? Right, their digital credentials. Do they still have? How do you know that they didn't install any back doors on any of the systems? Right, if they change the root password on one of the systems, now it doesn't matter if you remove their credentials; they can still maybe log in. Um, so these are important threats to consider. What else?
Human factor, what do you mean by that? Well, well yeah, not everybody at the company is educated enough to prevent attacks, so the weakest point would be the human. Right, so considering the human, which a little bit goes into insider threats, there have been instances <coughs> of people, um, I don't use people, I don't talk too much. Well, yeah, so this is a classic uh, pen testing trick of um, scatter USB drives in the parking lot, I'll put a label on them that says, you know, Q4 salaries um, or bonuses or something, right? And then so that's an incentive for people to plug them in. They take them, plug them into their computer, and <coughs> depending on the operating system, it used to be that uh, Windows would automatically auto run whatever USB drive you plugged in, and so then you'd be running code on their systems, and that's how you get it. So yeah, the human factor is incredibly important. What other ways do humans play a role in threats? Fishing. Fishing? So what's phishing? Uh, sending a malicious email with typically a web link that says uh, it can vary from place to place, but if it's spear phishing, it might be something specific to that company of like an IT email spoof saying, hey, we need you to go to this site real quick and follow these steps here to do something on your system. Right, so has anybody ever got an email that says, you know, uh, something <coughs> like, I don't know, hey, there was a problem with your account, your payment didn't go through, like, click here to fix it, or even things like paying your uh, credit, uh, I don't say credit card, they're pretty good about that, but let's say paying your power bill or your rent or something, they send you an email to say, hey, go do this. How do you know it's actually them and not somebody spoofing the email of them? How do you know that that site that you go to is actually your bank site or your power company site and is not somebody who created an identical looking site that's going to use that username and password you send in and steal it? Yeah? You can usually like check like the URL. So you can check the URL. Do you trust the URL? Uh, so a lot of times, I guess, there's like some key things that can throw something to be like suspicious. Yeah. What else? Yeah. I mean, I hate to say it, but a lot of them are just like terrible spellers. <laughs> yeah. So that's actually, that's a phenomenon. Uh, I can't remember the exact term. I think somebody called it basically the Nigerian scam theory in some sense, where some of these scams, they're deliberately, so like if it costs the spammer time to try to, or the scammer time to try to scam you, then it's in their benefit to actually weed out as many smart people who aren't going to fall for the scam. I mean, it's not smart, but... Uh, to weed out as many people who aren't going to fall for the scam. So they sometimes d will deliberately do that so that the only people who reach them are people who didn't see any of those red flags, so they're going to be on the hook and are going <laughs> to fall for whatever they do, <laughs> uh, which is kind of funny. But then you got to worry about the other way of, are you worried about somebody blindly you know, sending an email to everyone in this class to try to scam all of you or to target one person to say, I'm going to scam you. So I'm going to craft it, you know, I'm going to craft it exactly to get your interest and to get you to click on things. Yeah. Bye. Uh, when I worked uh, at the main trip over the summer, they would periodically send out security with testing phishing emails to see if they could get people. Yes, this is a good practice that companies do, is they'll try to fish their own employees so that that way they can try to educate them about the dangers of these kinds of things. Because it's very easy to click on a link, end up on a page, type in your username and password for whatever that page looks like, and then now all of a sudden you've given your credentials, your username and password to somebody else. Yeah? Yeah, I think I'd uh, check on the, the padwalk, the green padwalk next to the address. I can buy a green padlock for any domain that I own. Oh, and you Which goes, it's a similar, it's also a similar check thing. check if it's HTTPS. Yes, I could also Without buy. Without DS, it's not secure. Correct, yep. But I can, again, if I, control, so if I buy a domain name, let's say I'll pick on uh, Google. Like if I buy G-O-0-O-G-L-E.com, I can get an SSL certificate so it'll show a green lock, I can run HTTPS, and you have no way of knowing, and that's even just using ASCII characters, but now you can actually use all kinds of UTF-8 characters uh, there are a lot of characters in a lot of languages that look identical but are technically different characters, so you won't be able to tell. So a story that I'll tell that actually came up in depth on, uh, I'll tell the high level. So uh, essentially, one of the teams found out that one of the challenges 
they were able to basically redirect somebody. So somebody would access the challenge in their browser, and they were able to redirect the browser to go somewhere else. So what they did is they registered a fake domain. So our domain was, I think, ooverflow.io. They did ooverflow, but one of the L's was a capital I instead of an L. <laughs> and so they registered that domain name, they bought an SSL certificate, and they set up a fake um, score, like team interface. So the same, they took the HTML, the team interface that we were giving them, created a new team interface, and then created a new challenge there in there that had a binary that if you download and ran it was basically a Trojan backdoor that let the original team have access to your system. Um, yeah, we were like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> and apparently people fell for this. I won't name any names of any of the guilty or the innocent um, or the victims. Uh, and it was funny, we realized after the fact we had teams coming up to us going, when are you guys gonna release the next challenge? We're like, what are you talking about? Like, we haven't even said we're gonna do anything. Like, we'll do it whenever we're ready. Like, go away. We didn't realize they had seen this page, thought they'd found some bug, and had a like fake challenge there. So, anyway, so that goes to show you that even kind of the top hacking people can fall for these kinds of things because it's very easy to get tricked. Yes. Did you punish that team, or was it like, all right, that was pretty slick? <laughs> for things like that, it's almost anything goes. The rules are basically like no denial of service because that's lame and not fun for anyone. No like physical things, right? Like that's super lame. Um, but beyond that, and no like, I think we've structured the game in the past. I've heard that uh, some teams, so if like you only broke one service, but it's one that nobody else broke, you would sell your exploit to other teams for exploits for the other services. Um, so you'd be like, I'll give you this one that nobody has, but you give me like these other three. Um, so that's really discouraged, because that's lame. <laughs> it should be like your own team's uh, <coughs> skills. But yeah, no, when we heard that, we were like, that's super off. And they told us, of course, after the game was over, right? So yeah, it was very cool. Um, so yeah, phishing, huge threat. What other threats? Make um, fake downloads or something? Ooh, say it again. Harmful downloads. Demos, downloads? Yeah. So yeah, so um, yeah, so that's kind of in the maybe like a Trojan horse or some kind of executable that you're just downloading that you have no idea what it does. What else? You guys, so you, you, you need to start thinking evil. Like you're evil. You're. This is the um, part of the course where you continually have to put on your defender hat and then your attacker hat so you can think like an attacker to think about all the threats because if you haven't thought about a threat, if you never thought about phishing attacks in a CTF, you're going to fall victim to it, right? Because you have nothing in place to defend against that. Yes, in the back. I've heard something along the lines of putting malware on the actual like, Wi-Fi. On the Wi-Fi? Yeah, on the oh, yeah, okay. So you can, yeah, so the... Um, so Wi-Fi, right, you can have an open Wi-Fi that has no password or secured Wi-Fi. Uh, if you've never looked at it, maybe, I don't know if I have time in this course, but if it's an open Wi-Fi, anyone can see any packet that you're sending from your machine to that router, which means all I need to do is have a, you put your network card in promiscuous mode, which listens to all the packets that are getting sent, and I see everything that's getting sent. And even more than that, if you're making a request to a website, I can spoof the reply I guess restricted to the fact that it's not HTTPS. So any HTTP site you're visiting, I can inject something in there to do stuff. So this was actually uh, a huge problem. There was a tool released in, I can't remember when it was, but called FireSheet, where it would listen to the wireless network if it saw anybody's Facebook, because Facebook was transmitting the cookies over HTTP. So all you needed to do was steal that cookie and then you could become that user. So this was an automated tool to look at all the people's Facebook and then just one click, like send me to Facebook as this user, and then you'd be on Facebook as them. And Facebook fixed that very quickly. So they changed their <laughs> website because of this tool, which was super interesting. So yeah, if you think about it, if you're running a, um, a company with an open Wi-Fi, then you can see all these things, and this could be a huge threat that you're not considering. Yeah. Physical security, right? Nobody mentioned.
mention the, the problems that can come up with physical security. Would you trust me to be alone in a room with one of your laptops or desktops? Yes. Yes? Why? <laughs> or why not? What's your word phrase? Because I work for ASU? You don't know what I do. <laughs> why should you not? I mean, replace me with anybody else. Um, you can take that hard drive. Because I can take out the hard drive, and if your hard drive's not encrypted, I can look at all the data on your hard drive. If your hard drive is encrypted, but it's a weak password, I may be able to brute force that password and get access to your data. What else can I do? Have you, has nobody ever broken into a computer? Like, you like have an old computer, you don't know the root password, what do you do? Is everything lost? Change the root password. You what? Change the root password. Yeah, you change the root password because you have access to the hard drive, right? You can just change. I mean, the password is stored in a file, etc shadow. You can go in and just put a new hash there of a new password, boot it up, log in as root, and now you're into that computer. I could even, I mean, so I guess I should say I can't, but people can, and they've showed that. So we all kind of are under this delusion that hardware is very sane, but actually, so they've shown that um, your, if you think about your memory chips, right? So your memory chips, after the power goes out, they actually have a bit of a life to them, and you can extend that life by making the memory cold. So they've actually done this study where they would, um, I think it was before they turned off the hard drive. I can't remember exactly how it was done, but they would, you know, you, the cans of like computer spray, yeah. you turn it upside down, it gets super cold. So you do that, for basically like make the memory very cold, turn off the computer, take those memory sticks out, plug them in a new computer, and then you can read all the memory that was on that computer, which oftentimes includes the encryption key for the hard drive if your hard drive was encrypted. Um, so all kinds of crazy stuff that can happen with physical access. So, which is why if you want to talk about, well, I have a very secure you know, system, process, company, whatever it is, if somebody can waltz into your data center where all your computers are, it's essentially game over because they can do almost anything. What other threats? Yeah. Uh, not like, not necessarily related to uh, like home computers, but I know like credit card skimmers are everywhere. So. Yeah, so more personal security, and when we talk about stealing credit cards, so what's a credit card skimmer? Nothing. Yeah? It's a piece of hardware you put on like a gas pump, or like it swipes your card uh, as you push it through, so it gives away credit card. Yeah, so you think about, right, when you put your credit card through, there's a magnetic stripe on there that the credit card reader is reading. So what you do is put another device on front of it that reads the credit card as well, stores it, and then will send it wirelessly back to the um, back to the criminals so that they can then create fake credit cards and use them to purchase things on your account. Yeah? Can you access the chip cards now with Bluetooth? I don't know. The chip cards are supposed to be better, but it's tricky because they can still be used in, an, in a lot of non, because there's a lot of uh, places that don't have, that don't have the chip readers, so you could still use the card there. You could also use the card online once you have the number. Uh, Yes. False flag stuff. So False if I flag. put out like maybe one or two credit card skimmers, mm -hmm. but the bank has to go out and like check all their ATMs, mm. now I've forced the bank to waste a ton of money on a threat that wasn't all that large in the first place. Interesting. So yeah, threats about, let's say, um, or, okay, so I didn't talk. Or what you might want to do is if you're trying to break into the bank, do something like that, right? Distract, essentially distract the security team with a minor issue while you launch your big attack to actually break into the bank or something, right? So yeah, that's an interesting uh, point. Cool. So when we kind of think about threats, and this, and this is something we need to be, um, when we're thinking about them, we need to think about kind of, uh, there's, you know, you can, Think very broadly, and you need to be considering not just the things we talked about, but also other kinds of things. Yeah? What, what about threats uh, against uh, deep learning? Threats against deep learning. What do you, yeah, so you want to like, elaborate on that? Like computer vision, like more quick to attack some Yeah, so what about, switch. you think about um, voice, voice attacks. Right? So yeah, Alexa, Siri, all those kind of things, which I'll actually tell another story about DEF CON. This was for the qualification event. 
Uh, so one of the other people who I won't name, is anybody taking 466? Some of you. Uh, so <coughs> Jan Trishashashvili, who's teaching that class, created a challenge for DEF CON Qualls, which we had in May, and it was called Adam Tune. So the idea was he took all of my YouTube videos, uh, trained a basically voice recognition system on that, and the challenge was say this phrase in Adam's voice. And you had like 30 seconds to do it. If you couldn't do it, if you did it, then you got the flag, otherwise you didn't do it. So what happened is all of these people, all of these teams everywhere were watching my videos and downloading videos and getting snippets of my voice in order to fake this, um, to like fake voice authentication as me. It was very weird. Uh, <laughs> I am very glad that nobody called me. I was kind of worried that somebody would find my phone number and like get me to say whatever phrase it was. Uh, but yeah, it goes to show that you know the AI, machine learning, all these kinds of things are also other systems and threats that we need to consider and think about uh, when we're considering threats, right? So if you're basing everything on this voice recognition system, well, you better understand how good kind of these deep fakes are, where they can not not only uh, where they can capture your voice and create kind of a similar sounding voice which may pass authentication. There was also that Burger King commercial that uh, kept on linking to the Wikipedia page. People would go and change that so it would say other stuff. Oh, interesting. I hadn't heard about that. That's funny. <laughs> that, they have the commercial that says Alexa, what's in the uh, Burger King? So what's in the Alexa? Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's, and there's even people, I mean, that's, this gets kind of crazy when we think about threats, but there's been people doing, I think they called it dolphin attacks, where the idea is you can embed in like a sound clip the, hey Alexa, do this thing, whatever, but in a way that's not audible to a human, but it, tri it triggers the Alexa to do something. So when you're listening to that, you would never know that it's doing that, but your Alexa is actually listening to that and responding to that command, uh, which is pretty cool. So yeah, I don't trust any of this stuff. <laughs> Except it's super handy and useful, so what are you going to do? <laughs> okay, so these are actually kind of all the things we've talked about. Uh, when you think about threats, disclosure, threats to disclosure, of uh, um, accidentally leaking information, deception threats, or stuff. And these are kind of just high level categories to get you to think about the things <coughs> that we've talked about. So the specific categories themselves aren't super important, um, but the idea here is thinking about kind of threats in these ways. Awesome. So, okay, cool. So let's see which ones we've talked about and which ones I have here. So what's snooping or wiretapping? Yeah? Either putting a bug on a phone mm -hmm. or shifting the hardware over so that way you can have a backdoor to listen to your conversation. Yep. Or even, so you know, how do packets get from us to Europe? Underwater. Underwater, yeah, there's undersea cables that are linked between all the continents. I believe there's been at least, let's say, stories, because I don't know this is 100% true, but there's been stories of uh, submarines being close to those cables with taps on them so that people could see what data was being sent across them. Um, does everyone remember the, yeah? Would you consider key logging in the same time? I would say it's kind of tricky. I think it's more of a semantic distinction. In the end, it's the same end result. I th I'd say key logging requires somebody to execute something on your machine. But maybe, um, so like if you think this keyboard here, if you put a device at the end of this keyboard that listened to everything that was there and transmitted those keys somewhere else, I'd say that probably fits more under snooping. If it's just a key logger that's running on my machine, that's kind of more of a malware. Uh, kind of thing because it had to execute on my machine first to then do that. Um, so what was I saying? Oh, snooping, wiretapping. Oh yeah, the other interesting story about this so is the, the NSA Edward Snowden leaks. So one of the things that was mentioned in those leaks was that, um, that the NSA, so when you think about a big company like Google, Google's very good about encrypting everything that goes from you to Google. They use SSL, they make sure that everything's encrypted, but Google runs these huge data centers. So Google was not encrypting the information like in between servers or in between data centers, 
And so your data would go into Google and then it get processed in a bunch of places. Uh, it turns out when the Edward Snowden leaks that the NSA was tapping all of that internal communication that was going on. So they were getting all that data. I think, and not just a big on Google, I think it was also Microsoft and maybe another, I don't remember if it was also Amazon. So then, so you think about, they never thought about that threat when they were thinking about threats to their organization and their customer data. Should we worry about inter-server communication? <coughs> the answer was no until it was demonstrated to them that that's not the case and you should be worried about that threat. And so they ended up encrypting all of their internal communications too now. Um, so that was kind of interesting. Uh, modifications, altering data. So you think about um, if I'm going to make, let's say, like a stock order to my stockbroker or whatever, and I say buy you know, 100 shares of this, but somebody modifies that to say sell 100 shares of this, or turns it into buy 100 million shares of this, um, you know, that could have serious consequences. And so those are also threats we need to think about. Um, so some of the terms we use to think about this are uh, man in the middle. So the idea being, if you're in the middle of a communication between two parties, can you modify or change the values of the messages? So essentially thinking again about integrity, can you violate the integrity of the messages so that they don't know, each party doesn't know what they're talking about? Um, masquerading or spoofing. So this is kind of an interesting thing. How do you know that I'm actually the person who's supposed to be teaching this course? Because I stood up here on Thursday. And who would do that for an hour and 15 minutes and then again on Tuesday? Yeah. We know that it's you because you have a picture on your website and it's a thing that's out of oil. So OK, so picture on my website, but that's my, I mean, maybe I made that to be a fake website. Well, there's also a picture on the ASU website. Maybe the ASU website. How do you know they verified my ID? Because they have to verify it all too. Do they? Did they? Yeah, so that's kind of an interesting thing to think about, right? So, yeah. Okay, I've seen your YouTube channel. Nobody, no one other than a professor, you know, would post yeah. all those videos. Hey, you never know people are crazy. <laughs> it's a long con. Eventually, this is going to pay out for me. Yeah. Could you also think of like, like what might your motive be if you're like someone else? Like why would you? Like what yeah, would exactly. You get motive. Like what am I here to gain by teaching a course for somebody else? Right? Like I don't know. That would be silly. Uh, yeah, you think about upside too. So think about, and that's thinking about the context, right? It's like I'm not. If I started to say, oh, and by the way, if you want an A in this course, send me a couple bitcoins to this address, <laughs> then that should start triggering alarm bells because that's like a high value thing. And so maybe somebody is probably not something a professor would do. So maybe this is not who this person says they are. Or maybe they're super shady and should be fired. Um, all those things are possible truths. Um, and think, you know, this comes up a lot. In, it's easy to think about in the physical world because it's hard to verify identity, but this also comes up what we talked about in the phishing example, right? Because here you're visiting a website and it's a website pretending to be another website, right? So it's trying to masquerade or spoof as that other website. So except in the case, so anyone, um, what's tricky here is that this actually, this masquerading or spoofing thing is actually built into a lot of uh, systems. So do you think Michael Crow answers every email that he gets? Yeah. Personally? <laughs> he sits down, he's a machine, he just cranks out emails. I don't even want to imagine how long that would take to go through his emails. Um, so most email systems allow some form of delegation where you can say, okay, this person, my uh, executive admin, they are able to respond to emails as me. <clears throat> or this is also, you know, I have uh, some people at ASU I work with a lot, and so they can actually see my calendar and change events and do stuff because uh, I don't want them to bug me about it, so they can just go do it. Um, so this is actually an interesting thing because on the surface, masquerading or pretending to be somebody else seems like a clear security violation. But there are legitimate business cases, and in those cases it's called delegation. Right? You want somebody else to act as you. So what do you want in order to make that be not a clear and a clear security threat. Log yeah. Some way to verify the, the, the delegate. Like, like yeah. So you want to verify the delegate just as they're ver as you're verified. You have I was going to say something along the same lines. Be able to uh, verify who is uh, 
masquerading as someone else. Perfect. Log that activity. Log it. Yeah, you'd want to log all of the delegates' activity, right? So you could go back and see and audit that and say, okay, are they like, did they do anything weird, right, uh, that they shouldn't be doing? And that way, you have some. You can trust them to do things, and you can also verify at some point that they did things correctly. And that way, that gives you, I mean, some leeway. If somebody sent a mean email as a high-ranking person, they can say, oh, that was a disgruntled <coughs> admin. We can see that from the logs. It wasn't actually them. So we didn't really talk about this. What's repudiation? It could be received or sent, or sent. right? So like, anybody send an email or something that they regret? <laughs> no, you're all perfect. You tweet everything that you want to tweet and nothing more, right? Um, yeah, so repudiation is the ability, or you think about, I make a stock purchase with my stock broker and I say I want to buy a thousand of these, and then they do that and then the stock crashes and I go, oh, but I never sent that. That wasn't me, that must have been somebody else. Uh, so. By, and so the, the bank has to put things in place to say, do not share your password with anyone and make sure it's a strong password so nobody can guess. So when you log into the website, we know it's actually you because if anything we do on your behalf, you are responsible for, right? So this is, and there's, um, we'll get into cool crypto things that you can do to ensure this where you can verify that I actually said something. Um, you can think of this even in a classroom setting. If I say the exam is going to be on this date at this time, um, and I later say, oh, actually, that didn't happen, um, you would all be rightfully upset about that, right? You showed up for the exam date. Um, and if I could, so you want a way to prove that I actually said that at that point in time. Cool. Uh, similar type of thing, I guess, on the reverse is kind of a denial of receipt. So to say, like, oh, I never got this. Uh, that would be another threat that we need to worry about. And even delay. So when could delay be a threat? Yeah? Um, say, I don't know, your pet mad at someone mm -hmm. and you decide to um, hack into a pharmacy and delay their, the pharmacy from sending out like every pet or something. Wow, I got dark. Yes. <laughs> That's a good threat. That's a good attacker hat. I like it. So. Yeah, you could. You think about uh, logistically things not arriving on time when they should, which could be life um, threatening in that case. What else? Yeah. Well, so you know, to use the example you used <coughs> one, you call your stockbroker, mm -hmm. tell them, uh, you know, or you know, send in some kind of message, you know, sell this or whatever, and then you delay it x mm -hmm. amount of time. The price that you want to sell it at could change. Yeah, so the whole concept of basically like high frequency trading is that they make trades on the order of like microseconds. Like they pay a lot of money to be, I believe, in the same like server racks as the stock exchange so they can process and respond to things very quickly. Uh, I believe there's a whole complicated thing of setting up like, I believe it's like, I want to say microwaves or something to like, uh, decrease the delay that information takes to go from a stock exchange to other places. So if you're able to delay other people on that, then that could be a huge financial win for you because that information is important. Yeah? Um, the attacker needs some time to fake your voice. Mm. The attacker needs time to fake my voice, or fake a voice in general. Yeah, so maybe they want uh, more time to launch their attacks or something. Yeah, that's a good one. The, actually, so a cool thing I mentioned, um, I haven't mentioned here, I don't think. Did I talk to you guys about the email thing in the bank? Okay, so there's a service that exists on the like underground um, community where, so everyone's familiar with spam? Do you all think spam filters are pretty good at blocking out spam? More or less, use Gmail, you're going to get very little spam. So there's a service that exists which will send random emails to an email address of your choosing. So you pay for it, they will just send, keep sending emails with completely random content. Will a spam filter mark those as spam? Depends on the content. Let's say it's like gibberish or random. I mean, in general, if it's not going to match any previously seen spam, if it doesn't mention Viagra or whatever the spam terms are nowadays, <laughs> it's not going to get flagged, right? So it's going to go through. 
So why does this service exist? To annoy someone, oh yes, that's actually probably useful. What about more than annoying? Could it actually be used Very as a, other emails. What was that? Very other emails. Very other emails? Yeah, so you think about a, let's say you're planning on breaking into a bank. You can be rest assured that they have a lot of um, detection systems that are gonna send emails to the security team whenever they notice things happening or when there's a transaction over a large amount, things like that. So what you do beforehand is you sign Right before you're about to launch your attack, you sign the emails up of the security team to this service, so their inbox gets flooded with all of this garbage that is hard to delete, I mean, it's just coming through, and then that way they don't see the alerts because they're dealing with this thing. So you can think of that in terms of this a delay thread where, okay, yes, you have this awesome monitoring system that alerts you through email, but how can you guarantee that you'll see that email right when it comes in and it's not being delayed by something else? Cool. And also denial of service, which we talked about with availability, right? So how easy is it? How many? The main thing to think about is how much resources would it take somebody in order to block all legitimate users from accessing this system? Is it $10? It's probably not a lot of money. Is it $100, $1,000? If it's going to take a million dollars, then you may be OK with that, right? Saying like this system is not important enough for us to justify a multi-million dollars worth of resources attack. So it's like, well, we go down, that's fine, but the attacker just burned a million dollars on taking us down. Yeah? What's the line between like a really long delay and just denial of service? It is very fine, so it depends on what you're talking about. Yeah, so denial of service has kind of morphed into its own thing. When you talk about like a DOS attack or a distributed denial of service attack, um, so it has a little bit more concrete where you're trying to overload a system. But delay is kind of more subtle in thinking about that more. But you can achieve a delay effect with a denial of service. So, Yeah, can you explain the way again? The, the delay? So delay would be some kind of threat where, I mean, it, that's, let's take it not into a pharmacy example, but you know, you're running a business and you're making some widget foo and you depend on inputs bar and baz. And so somebody maybe even doesn't hack you, but hacks into your um, contractors to delay that shipment of your bars or bases or whatever, your inputs. And so they don't arrive on time, which means you can't deliver your widgets on time, which means you're in breach of contract, you owe people money. It's a huge, big problem just because somebody added an artificial delay into, into the process. Cool, so how do we defend against threats? Shug our hands in the air, say, ah, there's too many of them. We can't possibly do anything. Let's just give up. Have an ostrich approach. You just bury your head into the sand and do nothing. Yeah. Define specific security practices, you know, like password is locked, and APs get Yes. Okay. So, and that's would be a policy, right? So you could create some kind of things. If you're worried, let's say, about uh, people masquerading as other users on your system, you could create a password policy <coughs> that says all passwords must be like this, or passwords can't be like this, easy to guess, all these kinds of things. Yeah, in the back. Um, hardware. Hardware. Yeah, so you may invest in hardware to combat specific threats. So if you're worried about a denial of service, buy more machines, you buy a, a server to run in front, you can pay a company like Cloudflare, Cloudflare or Akamai <coughs> to help you deal with a denial of service attack. Yes? Uh, maybe securing your devices. So like if it's a server, you might defend, like have like guards or something. Yeah, so actually you can use a, uh, a lot of actually data centers will have kind of things where it's like two-factor authentication. You need to show your ID card to a person. There's like a thumbprint reader, maybe even a retina scanner. Um, inside the thing, they'll have, I think it's called a man trap, which is like a thing that, like a big cage that comes down on somebody if they're not authorized to be there and try to break in. Uh, the, server, the server rack itself could be locked. Um, so you are the only people who have the keys to get in there, right? So yeah, you can um, do those kind of things. What else? Yeah. Um, maybe have like some fake soft targets. 
Yeah, so this is kind of the, the idea is the honeypot approach. So you can create some fake systems and say, watch anything that happens to those systems, right? Because they're fake, nobody's actually using them. So I know if there's any traffic to them, it's probably malicious traffic or something bad is happening. Um, the trick about redirecting them to that is you need to be able to identify an attack in the first place. If you can identify an attack in the first place, you should just stop it, in most cases. Yeah. Uh, inform your user base. Mm. So I'd say educate maybe your user base. Yeah, so try to identify what threats come from humans or come from users and spend money, effort on educating them, right? Which is what happens. Do you all have to take like the ASU information security training? Uh, Only for us. Yeah. Stand. Oh, cool. Awesome. <laughs> you should be taking that too. Um, yeah, man, you think about ASU, ASU is a crazy problem. I was talking with, um, it's actually all your fault. Um, no, just kidding. Uh, no, but I was talking with, I think it was, I don't want to mention names, but I was talking to somebody and they mentioned one of the, when you think about a company, what do you think the average turnover rate of employees is per year? Like turnover rate means how many employees leave per year? How many new employees come in? Percentage-wise? Yeah, rough. Like, like all the employees? I would say 10, maybe less, yeah. even 5%. You think about a whole big company. Um, what do you think the turnover rate is for ASU? Including yeah. students? Like, <laughs> yeah, including students. Like oh, yeah. Not just employees, right? Because they're all on the same network. We're all on the ASU network. It's like 25%, right? Because you have a huge core, like basically a quarter of you all graduate as seniors and then a new quarter of students come <coughs> in. And so the ASU network, basically not just the network, but you have to deal with people who you haven't really trained to be on your network. They're coming in. It's just they're bringing all kinds of devices. It's like defending a university network it sounds like an insane job to me. I'm happy that there's people who do that. Yeah. Uh, back to this. Yes, yeah, please. Um, one of, like a general way is kind of like predicting what might like attacks before they happen? Right, so one of the, you know, exactly. So not just predicting attacks, but predicting what is an attacker likely to do. So you can do this in a number of ways, right? You can actually simulate an attacker. You can go hire a company to break into your system. So this is usually called a penetration test. And it could be even a physical penetration test. So I'll try to bring in some people this semester. Uh, I'll try to bring in some people this semester to give guest lectures on this, on some of this stuff, who actually do this for a living. Um, but I remember listening to some stories where the goal is to get up to the third floor, to the, not the third floor, but like, you know, the 20th floor of some building, some super secure building, and the company hires you to do that. And so they have all these tricks about how to blend in and how to get in without a badge and all this stuff. And, you know, just like a normal security um, computer pen test, it's like, I don't know, 90% of the time you're able to get in. It's like crazy. Are like protocols the way you're trying to avoid this? What do you mean protocols? Like having well-defined um, so means of communication where there's no ambiguity. Mm, okay, you know, so between maybe like people, yeah. or like in the company or the organization, yeah. So I kind of put those under policies too, right? So these are like, you have policies, policies can be any number of things, right? Like a, a one really good policy to have would be how does money transfer out of your company? Right? Who is authorized to spend money from the corporate checkbook? Uh, there's actually a large case of uh, basically, it's, I think they call it whale phishing, where instead of, so normal phishing is just you're sending out emails to collect credentials on whatever service. Spear phishing is you're targeting a specific person. Whale phishing is you're targeting like the CEO or you're targeting the, usually the CFO and trying to convince them to send money uh, from the account, from the corporate account to you. So what, uh, one case that I've heard happen is, <laughs> I think it was the pen testing team, so this was like a, a good scenario. They called the CEO in the middle of the night on their home phone to see what the CEO sounded like yelling. And then one of the people on the team practiced that voice. And then when they knew the CEO was on travel, called the CFO yelling about, I need, you know, we've got to transfer this money to this account. I'm closing the deal with so and so, and we need you know fifty thousand dollars into this account. You got to make it happen. It's got to happen now. Um, otherwise, we're going to lose the deal. And then they start to do that process, right? 
So that goes to protocols and not having procedures in place of how, you know, like a two-step, a two-phase commit in some sense of who is authorized to do that. Um, what happens when a CEO asks you for something crazy like that? Do you <coughs> double check with them, check with them, and maybe the CFO to make sure this is something, you know, those kinds of things, right? And having those <coughs> procedures and policies in place aren't super important because then that protects, you know, the employees from being like, well, I can't do this. It's not, it's not part of the policy, right? It's not part of the proper protocol. Yeah. Say audit log everything. We will audit everything. Yeah. So this is a good. Um, so this is when thinking about how to what happens after something happens, right? So it's very easy to spend all of your time thinking about building a beautiful castle with beautiful walls and hiring guards and thinking about how you're going to protect things. But the reality is something is always going to happen, right? So a key component is thinking about what's, I mean, if something happens, how can I figure out what happened? And then that way I can put new procedures in place. Um, that's weird. OK, cool. So essentially, the way I think about these and the way to think about threats and how to defend against them, it really boils down to two things. And pretty much everything we've said boils down to these things. So. One is policies, so we talked about policies. What, how should people be operating, or how should systems be operating? Um, as an organization, what are you kind of requiring people to do? The second one is security mechanisms. So what mechanisms have you put in place to try to ensure certain things? So what's the difference here between these two? Yeah. Policies are more people-oriented, and mechanisms are more yeah, in some sense, right? And there's a um, there's a very tight, I think, coupling here between them. So they're not as it's not as just like this black and white, you know, this is a policy and this is a mechanism, right? Um, let's think about a lock on a door. Is that a policy or a mechanism? It's a mechanism, right? It's a it's a lock. It goes in the door. There's a key associated with it that can open up that door. So what's the policy? But if you just have a lock that's unlocked all the time, is that an effective security mechanism? Yeah. No, clearly not, right? Because it's not, whatever your overall security goal is, that's not actually doing anything, right? If your goal is to keep out people who should not be out, then it's not doing anything. So what kind of policy would you need there? Uh, yeah? Rules for who holds the key. Say that again? Rules for who holds the key. Rules for who holds the key, who, pat, who has a copy of the key, can the key be copied? How the key passes from person to person? What else would you need? Yeah, when it's locked. When to lock the door, right? So you think about a, a store, right? If the door is locked while the store is open, that would be an availability problem, right? Because nobody can get in. And actually, maybe worse, nobody can get out. That could be another fire hazard. Yeah. Escort procedures. Escort procedures in what sense? What does that mean? Uh, if I don't hold the key, but I need access to that room anyway, can someone that holds the key bring me in there with them? Right, so exactly, and that's a great great question that's often lost, uh, a great uh, example that's often lost <coughs> is, um, is the person holding the key basically own that room and everything that happens in it? And so they can just bring whoever they want in, they can make copies of that key. Um, what's the policy on who they bring into that room or into that store? Yeah. Um, how often locks need to be changed? How often to change locks? What happens after an employee who owned that key is let go? Do we create new locks? Do we rekey everything? Um, that way we know they don't have access, right? So these are all, and you can see we've touched on a lot of things that are mixes of mechanisms and policies. So we have this key and this lock mechanism, but how to actually use that effectively to accomplish our security goals is really the realm of the policy, right? About when is it supposed to be locked? Whose responsibility is it to lock it when they leave? Are they respons I mean, responsible for doing that, right? So you have a policy that says, the last employee to leave the store must lock, lock the store. And in the morning at 8 AM, you must unlock the door. Um, and then you'd have to worry about what happens if somebody needs, if maintenance crews need to go in, or the cleaning crew, what happens if the store gets cleaned at night? All these kind of things actually need to uh, be thought about. Cool. OK, so now we're going to, with the remaining time, this is fun, we're going to talk about a house. So everybody know what a house is? Yeah. <laughs> we don't know.
but you've seen one, I think. You understand the, uh, a house in general? Okay, so if we think of a house as something we want to defend, What are the threats to this house? Yeah. Thieves. Thieves, burglars. What is that when you break that down? What is that? Intruders. Intruders. What's an intruder? External attack. Say it again? Trespassers. You guys are just naming synonyms. So I need to find it. These are all good synonyms. I'm not saying they're wrong. There's the one that that one thinks in your house and you want to Yes, so somebody who's unauthorized to be in your house who wants to get into your house for the purposes of stealing <coughs> something, but do we really care what their purpose is? I mean, not, not really, it kind, of, it kind of depends there. Yeah, in the back. Natural disasters, what kind of natural disasters are you worried about? Hurricane, hurricanes. You live in the middle of the desert. Okay. Dust storms, <laughs> Dust storms. there you go, there you go. Um, or trees falling on your house in a dust storm or wind heavy event. What was that? EMP. What's an EMP? <laughs> that is a threat. So this is part of um, thinking about defending a system. You need to consider all kinds of threats. Yeah. Someone just walking up and hucking a bomb at your house. Walking up and hucking a bomb at your house. Okay. I mean, yeah. you could throw those scorpions with like Oof. even like so like 200, 300 feet away. You could just be lobbing bombs at a house. Right. So you, if you think of it higher, you're worried about. Um, like pro destruction to the property from an unauthorized person, right? Because if you're defending your house in such a way that nobody can destroy it, then you can't remodel your house, right? Because you'll stop whatever construction crew is coming in uh, to do stuff. What are you saying? Maybe just a uh, fire in general. A fire, yeah, like destruction. Seen, uh, scorpions, that was a good, terrible one. I had, uh, yeah, I had this happen, I think it was the first time I saw it 340 where a student was had a scorpion on their backpack and then was stung by a scorpion, so we had to spray the whole room. Oh yeah. So if you see a scorpion, kill it. That's that should be a normal rule because apparently other students saw it and didn't say anything. <laughs> 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 look out! Look out for your fellow students. All right. Yeah. Uh, decay. Oh, decay. Oh, that's good. So basically, like you'd be worried about termites or something getting into the wood of the house. Yeah. Uh, I just like had a question. It's like, yeah. so. We're listing off all these threats and stuff. So how do we determine like which threat is like worth defending and which one is not? Exactly. How do you know? Cost benefit. Is it cost just, like, benefit like, analysis? Maybe like a statistics can you, thing. Like, well, like oh, you know, we never have hurricanes here, so why defend against hurricanes? Right. Okay. So we said we never have hurricanes here. Why defend against hurricanes? How do we know where the house is? We, we're building in Arizona. Did I say we're building in Arizona? Yeah, you I did. did say desert. You did. Right. I said we're in the desert. Why would you think about a hurricane? Maybe. <laughs> Let me check the tape. <laughs> they can comment. What else didn't we say about the house? How much we're going to spend on it? How much we're going to spend on the house? What else? How big is it? How big is it? How many entry points? How many entry points? What else? Yeah. Yeah, what 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 does the house like physically look like? What else? What's it for? What's it for? Who's it for? Right? Is it for one of you? Is it for me? Is it for somebody with a net worth of like a billion dollars, like Bill Gates? Do you think we'd have to consider different threats for every one of those different scenarios? Right? Bill Gates is gonna have to be thinking about a lot different threats than maybe he may be much more worried about intruders than we'll be worried about or the people hucking bombs threat. <laughs> he may be worried about that, and we may be less worried about that. right? So I deliberately <coughs> underspecified the house to get us to then think about threats, but then go back around. So OK, so then what kind of house do we want to build? So let's say it's for a normal-ish person. Does that make sense? Normal person, I don't know, how many stories do you want? Two stories? Two in a basement. Two in a basement. <laughs> do they do basements in there? <laughs> Interesting. Okay, cool. Okay, so two in a basement. What are we making it out of? What are we making it out of? I don't know. Let's say wood, but that may impact our. Uh, let's say we already have a house. Let's say we're not building it. So we have a 
house made out of like normal house stuff. I don't know. I'm not a person. <laughs> I don't own a house yet, so I'm not that familiar with all that stuff. Which is, uh, and so, okay. So then, when we think about the threats, so what threats? So net, then we do need to do a cost-benefit analysis, and it's not something that you can really kind of hang a. I don't know. There's been a lot of attempts to try to quantify it. If you can quantify it reliably, you will be a very rich person because this is something that is very difficult to do of quantifying the cost benefit analysis of threats to a system. Um, so when we think about that, so normal house, um, so what kind of, so what kind of threats? So like, are we worried about aliens coming? And yes, yes, yeah. Some of you maybe. <laughs> And that would be very bad, right? So if you're sucked up into an alien spaceship from your house, that may be something you want your house to prevent, right? So the negative is really bad, but if you think about the possibility of that thing happening, it's probably astonishingly <coughs> low until some weird news comes out at some point. Um, so we can basically kind of ignore that threat and say, but as part of considering threats, we think about it, but then we kind of set that aside and say, okay, we're not gonna actually do that. Yeah? So a big part about, um you know, just, or I guess preventing, or yeah, mm -hmm. preventing threats is um, determining how much of your functionality you lose when you mm -hmm. or when you prevent threats. Yep. So, like, if you booby trap all your, you know, windows and doors, then how are you going to get in? Yes, it's also depending on the state illegal. I don't know. I'm not a lawyer, but <laughs> in some places, it's like if you booby trap stuff, you're liable for what happens to somebody when they. And then you think about. So then when we think about threats, we think about well. Uh, one of the things we didn't talk about is what about if I, you know, the person living in the house has a medical emergency, right? They would want um, the ambulance to come in and help them, and if their place is booby trapped, they're not going to get the help they need, right? So that's definitely something uh, to think about. So what other threats are we thinking about? Yeah. Uh, the neighborhood you're living in. The neighborhood we live in. Say it louder. Depending on the quality of the other homes around you. Yeah. So you may be. Uh, it just may change your threat posture about what you're worried about, right? And do you need? I don't know, if you really value your privacy, you may want huge fences that are super thick that, or whatever, um, or you may be fine with no fences. I mean, there's some neighborhoods or areas where that happens. Uh, what else, what kind of threats? And then now we'll start thinking about how realistic and should we be thinking, like defending against that, yeah? Getting swatted. Getting swatted, so what's getting swatted? So someone called the SWAT team. Yeah, so this is an unfortunate thing that happens um, where somebody will spoof a call to a police station, say I'm being held hostage, I'm at so-and-so address, and then they send a SWAT team over there and it's your address and nobody's held hostage. Uh, it's actually really, I think somebody died from doing, from that happening um, a while back. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's a hard one to defend from just a house level, but it's possible. Ooh, doorbell ditchers, so <laughs> if you're worried about neighborhood kids ringing your doorbell because you're apparently an old man or something. Uh, I'm just kidding. Whoa, bro. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah, people uh, on your people getting on your lawn and you want the kids to get off your lawn. Um, what else? What other threats? Um, maybe you have a pool. A pool? Clean. Yeah, you may have a pool, so you may... Um, I don't know if this is a problem in Arizona, but my parents were just saying that they had... Uh, they're renovating their backyard, and they had a bunch of deer tracks leading like to the <laughs> pool area. And then, now, but they're super worried because there's a cover on the pool, and they're worried that a deer is going to fall in the pool and end up like dying in the pool. So now they're worried about what mechanisms to put into place so that deers don't go into that area. Um, so you think about things like that. Uh, what else? You're going to make sure uh, whoever built it didn't skimp on materials. Mm, okay. So yeah, you want to think about threats. And that's more to kind of the availability, the structure of the house, making sure the house is sound. In some sense, there's little you can do unless you know what to do or you have somebody else audit it, right? So the, the reality there is depending on your budget, right? And that's another thing to think about is we talked about the realism of a threat. So we talked about, I mean, think about it is should I be worried? So if we're building this house for a normal person, should they be worried about people tunneling into the ground and tunneling up into their basement? No, probably not. Should Bill Gates or somebody like that be worried about that? Maybe. I mean, it depends on what you have in the house, right? But you know, it happens to banks. It, if 
you're worth a lot of money, you maybe want to consider that threat. Yeah, in the back. I can't hear you. Ooh, yeah, so this happens a lot now. Uh, stealing stuff off the front porch, you get a lot of Amazon deliveries and people uh, steal packages off your front porch. Yeah, this is a much, and which, so, so then, okay, so then this is a good discussion. Let's talk a little briefly about like what, what kinds of policy, Okay, so what kind of policies will we put in place to defend these threats and mechanisms? Let's go with both. So take a threat, say what you want to defend against, why you think it's a legitimate threat, and talk about how you try to defend it. Yeah. Um, against the burglary? Yeah. I would use uh, gated windows. Okay. So they can have a custody of the windows. Cool. Okay, yeah, so you can put um, bars on your windows, right? So. Why, so I guess not really thinking about that too much, but so that would be a mechanism that you could put in, install into your house to prevent burglaries through windows. What else, what are some other things, yeah? To prevent fire, you can keep an extinguisher and make sure you always have a cell phone so you can call the fire department. There you go, so you could, so that would be, so the making sure you have a fire extinguisher would be a mechanism, right? A policy would be replacing that fire extinguisher every year or however long it needs to be. Um, along with that, what you didn't say is making sure you have uh, fire alarms in every room of the house, or what are those called? The smoke detectors, there we go. Uh, the smoke detectors in every room, and then you need a policy about how often you check those smoke detectors, making sure that they're still working, that they have batteries, right? Because if they die, then your mechanism is ineffective. Uh, what was the last thing you said? Uh, I just said make sure you have a phone so that we can Phone, yeah, so that would be policy, right? So that would be, you may actually want to have a landline because if there's a fire, maybe, well, your cell phone would probably work. I don't know, if an EMP goes off and you're worried about that, <laughs> your landline is still going to work, most likely. Yeah. Uh, a policy for keeping people from stealing your packages might be having them get a signature mm. or putting it in like a PO box. Yeah, so one thing would be requiring all packages to have a signature. That again has the trade off where now that's super annoying if you're not home. Um, or have a specific area where they can leave. Or maybe, I mean, another way would be you have like a fenced out area where the UPS or whatever drivers know the code to get in to drop the package off, but other people don't. So that could cut down on that. Yeah. If you don't want anybody to go in, whether you're home to hurt you or not, mm -hmm. either keep the doors locked at all times, you know, lock it every time you close mm -hmm. it, uh, or a security system. Yeah, so definitely, okay, so good. So policy would be always lock the door when you get home. Do you all do this? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah? Okay, see, I thought, okay, yeah. So I grew up, uh, both of my parents were with the Sacramento Sheriff's Department, so we like always locked our door. I mean, it's just like a natural thing. You go home, lock the door. And then I started living with people in college, and I realized that was not a standard thing. They'd be like, Adam, why do you keep locking these doors? I'm like, we're, we're here. I don't want anyone else to come in. Like, I don't know. It's just a natural thing. You go in, you close the door. I'm like, I don't know. Lock the door. What's the, what's the big problem? Um, so yeah, and then the mechanism might be a security system, right? You may install a security system. Um, that also has downsides in terms of usability, which you may come home or you may invite somebody over to your house, maybe not give them the code, um, all kinds of things, you know. So you, you have to think about this because all these things we talked about all cost money, right? And so you don't have a, if your house is, let's say, I don't know, $300,000, if you're going to spend a million dollars to secure it, that may, might not be the best way to invest your money, right? Um, yeah. Yeah, here. Guard dog, yeah. So you may get a guard dog mechanism, right? That can, uh, depending on the dog, hopefully it's actually a guard dog and doesn't just lick whoever comes to the house. Yeah. Insurance. Insurance, yes. So a lot of the natural disasters, you say, wow, it's really difficult for me to prevent a tree falling on my house. I'm going to pay a company who will reimburse me if something like that happens. And so that way you can get you... If that happens, you're not out the entire value of the house. You are paying to kind of mitigate some of that. Yeah. Would that be policy or mechanism? Good question. I think it would be a mechanism, I would say. But the policy would be I have to have insurance, like homeowner's insurance, right? That's what, that's what I think you're 
your policy would be you have to have insurance and the mechanism would be actually have it. Like, and the policy would be I need to pay my, my insurance premiums on time, right? Because if you don't have that, then th that mechanism you have doesn't actually work. Cool, all right, this is a great discussion. I appreciate that and see you on Thursday.